So welcome at our birthday party in this special building, this special day. And it's always nice to have visitors on your birthday. And I think, no, we really have a lot of visitors. So that makes us happy. And this morning we already had a nice interactive lecture with Leon Heus from Studium Generale. And now we have uh, two people who are very involved with this library building. Our director of the library, Irene Haslinger, and Francine Hube, the architect of this building. And um, I would invite Irene to come over and they will share their vision with you. A warm welcome to you all. Today, we celebrate the 25th anniversary of this beautiful library building. And therefore, it's appropriate to look back 25 years. But I'd like to invite you to look back a bit further than that. Let's go back to 323 BC. In this year, Alexander the Great, you see him in this picture with his beautiful horse, Bukephalos. Um, well, he died. And um, his huge realm was divided among his generals. And one of these generals, Ptolemy, got Egypt. And so it happened that Ptolemy found himself in Egypt, a land he didn't understand at all. He didn't speak the language, because he was Greek, or even worse, he was Macedonian. And Macedonians spoke a Greek dialect that was difficult to understand for other Greeks. Macedonians weren't allowed to participate in the Olympics unless they asked explicitly for permission. And on top of it all, Macedonia was still a traditional monarchy whereas other Greek city-states were busy experimenting with other innovative forms of government and organization. And that's why Ptolemy always felt a stranger in his own land. But somehow Alexander had managed to change the Greeks' contempt for Macedonia into some sort of admiration. Alexander was such a powerful personality that the Greeks had embraced him, even though he was Macedonian. Alexander had become a national symbol because he had liberated the Greeks from the Ottoman suppression and he had conquered the world. But here in Egypt, without his soulmate Alexander, Ptolemy felt he an outsider again. He didn't grasp the bureaucratic customs. He suspected his courtiers to make fun of him behind his back. He had no sympathy for the strange gods depicted with human bodies and animal heads. He never stopped to feel impressed by the pyramids, the galloping camels, the sandstorms, and the muddy Nile full of lurking crocodiles. But Alexander had taught him one thing. Think big. You cannot grasp those strange symbols. You invent your own symbols. You feel a bit overwhelmed by Egypt's ancient history and tradition? Well, you move the capital to Alexandria, a new city without a history, and you turn it into the center of the Mediterranean. And that's how Alexandria became a hub for trade between East and West. It developed into one of the largest cities of antiquity. And in order to lead ships safely in and out its harbor, Ptolemy built the lighthouse of Alexandria, one of the seven wonders of the world. And you see it here in the picture. But Ptolemy did more. In the spirit of his friend Alexander, he wanted to collect all the existing knowledge in the world. The internet, avant la lettre. And he wanted this knowledge to be accessible to everyone. The internet combined with the open science principles. And that's why he founded the famous library of Alexandria. Leon also mentioned it this morning in his talk. 
He sent out troops all over the Mediterranean and ordered them to collect all existing books. And if necessary, they were allowed to use force. So these troops became hunters, hunters for books. And each time a ship arrived at the harbor, it would be searched for books, and the books were taken to the library. In the library, which contained at its height 400,000 scrolls, which is the equivalent of 100,000 books, the scrolls were catalogued and uh, transcribed. And some say the transcriptions were done so accurately that it was impossible to notice whether originals or copies had been returned. Ptolemy was a real visionary. He understood that the knowledge hidden in those large collections of scrolls wasn't meant to stay hidden. Instead, this knowledge had to flow and create new knowledge. Like the River Nile, it flows, and each year it floods and brings fertile soil for new life. And that's why Ptolemy built the Museum next to the library. And the Museum was the first edition of our university. The best writers, poets, scientists, and philosophers from all over the Mediterranean were invited, and they got a position for life. So these first professional researchers didn't have to worry about tenure, housing, salary, taxes, no. Their lives consisted of teaching, debating, and doing research. And after sunset, they had dinner together in the Great Hall. And sometimes, Ptolemy himself took a seat at the table to hear about the most recent ingenious insights. That was 2,300 years ago. How about now? Libraries and universities are still closely related. Without a library, no education, no research. And still researchers from all over the world gather to work on scientific breakthroughs based on existing knowledge. As a university of technology, we are no longer hidden behind safe castle walls. We are part of society trying to solve the societal challenges of the 21st century. Impact for a better society. And there are still library employees who facilitate all this. We don't write our catalogues on clay tablets anymore, in which we scratch the location of a scroll. Instead, we assign a URL to our publications and data sets, a location on the internet, a digital counterpart. We still welcome students and researchers into our beautiful library building, where we offer them a quiet and safe learning place, just like the Museum. I believe, in essence, we are still doing the same as Ptolemy did 2,300 years ago. We bring existing knowledge and brilliant minds together in a setting that inspires researchers, teachers, and students to create new knowledge. The only difference is the context. We have become a hybrid organization that combines the digital and the physical domain. After this journey into the past, it's now time to look ahead, to look into the future. And I'm very well happy to welcome Francine Huber, the architect of this wonderful library building. She will talk to you about the library of the future. Dankjewel. Ik zal even de afstandsbediening pakken. Kan ik gewoon zo praten, ja? En, en zien jullie me ook als ik hier sta? Want dan kan ik zelf ook de plaatjes zien. Um, wie kent dit plaatje nog? Ik dacht ook vandaag, ik ben nog de enige die hier... Uh, uh, eigenlijk het hele proces... Ik ken het nog? Ja. <laughs> maar zo zag de TU eruit toen wij hier aan begonnen te werken. En um, tijdgeesten heb je ook mee te maken, zoals jij net vertelde. En het, dit ontwerp, ik dacht, ga toch even iets vertellen over wat de gedachten toen waren. Ook heel erg leuk dat Leo er was, want die was natuurlijk toch echt onze inhoudelijke opdrachtgever. Uh, het gebouw is eigenlijk een enorme reactie op het gebouw wat hiernaast stond. En dit was gewoon een parkeerterrein. Hè, en wij noemden dit gebouw wat... Uh, wat als een soort spaceship op de, op de maan was ge... Oh, ik moet Engels praten, wat moet ik doen? Sorry. 
So we, we, we named it, we, we called this the building a kind of uh, ship landing on the moon, and it also really looked like the moon, huh? the whole public space around it. And we called it the frog. Frog needs grass, that's what we said. And I was dreaming of that this whole area should become much more campus, because I told you it was just parking, uh, parking and cars. And I remember Leo telling that he wanted this building to function as an airport terminal. You know, quick, you get a pick, you get your books. But I thought, an airport terminal? Then it should at least be like as beautiful as a TWA building in New York, what is now a hotel, I have to tell you. And I was still dreaming of books, I like the Aspen uh, uh, thing. But also it was a kind of disappointing. This was the library at that time, you know, in the, in the, in the city center. And I learned that these books are next to each other because they are millimeters the same height. Or that computers were like that. It was very chaotic. And we made this, the design of this building really belonging to the other building. Had that we put the, the frog in the grass, changed that public space, elevated it as a piece of um, landscape, as a piece of paper, uh, lifted it, put a cone through it as a symbol of the beauty of a technical university. Had a symbol. It's it's a logical form, and that became the library. They really like uh, belonging together to each other, and I call we called it really a building of grass and glass. Eh? It was always funny when I talk to Japanese or Chinese people. It was glass and glass, but it's grass and glass. Um, and what I think was very special at that time, it was totally sustainable. Our whole team uh, had been studying here at the Technical University of Delft, not just the people of Meccano, but also the structural engineer and the electronic and the data and all these things. They all, this was their um, university. So we were very much encouraged to make it uh, totally uh, sustainable, what was very unique for that time, also to use the grass. And I remember that, Leo, you were allowed to put the, um, the top on the, on the building, but even the construction, and even to get it built, was a, a very challenging journey. But we did it all together. And also just selecting materials. You know, at that time, we built this building and designed it for just a school budget. I think this is the 90s. And we were really bringing materials together, like the Sahara color and the blue, and all these materials, what was really deselected. But I also had to select what I had to learn, grass. You know, what kind of grass to put on this building? And that this one looks as a continuation of the public space and the grass we put around the, the, the aula, the auditorium. And also the whole interior. And I know that um, Leo always said, uh, Francine, I know the library will change. And partly I know what will happen. And partly, we don't know what will happen. For instance, cataloging, so that, that part was all catalogs. And we were prepared that it will go away. Um, one important thing, and this is really the second one, was the kind of how to organize the service uh, in a kind of organic way, I called it. And this was at that time, you can see here, this we made already from steel, what was cheaper, because we, will knew, we knew that it would go away in the future. So it's really about this wall was very important. I know Leo's idea was to put all the books here in, yeah, you don't need to see them. I think we had a kind of one million uh, books. And we took 80,000 out to make this hanging book wall. It's a hanging construction, very essential for the whole atmosphere. And of course, this cone um, was really celebrating the, of, of the technical university, um, pinching through a landscape. This was, do you remember? It was full of computers. It was unique in the, in, in the world even, to put 300 computers in one room, producing a lot of heat, I can tell you, and no Wi-Fi. So we had all these cabling, what almost didn't fit in the um, floor. And also, remember, we had these beautiful magazines, uh, periodicals. They're not there anymore. We still have two of them at Meccano. But also be aware that the, what's underneath you, uh, this is what I call the bel etage, uh, it's totally open and flexible. Of course, there is the uh, archive of the, the, um, the special books, but you have flexibility to change and use this basement lower ground floor in a different way for the future. 
And also we really tried to bring the two buildings together and we even were involved of updating at that time, I think it's already changed again, of the auditorium building with the Mensa at that time. This really became, I think, uh, very much the icon of the university. It's still very much loved. It's still, I think, timeless uh, with this green engineering, something what you really want to express uh, as the university. And also, it's always beautiful when the snow is lying there and if people bring their, um, start to snowboard on, on top of it. This was 40 years ago. Zeitgeist. Yeah, like you were saying, tight guys, what also happened in Alexandria. It was, you know, this was the future. Cars, uh, every building, every faculty, its own uh, building, faculty of architecture, still under construction. And this was in 2012, you know, how we changed it. And the library was part of it and the inspiration for us also to make the whole park, uh, what now is called Makel Park, to celebrate and to come by and bring together in a sustainable, the different faculties. This, it, this, it was like this, and we changed it in that, with even the hills to uh, deal with people like to sit on hills, but it's also very sustainable to collect the water in the, yeah, in the dips. But still, like you said, it's still, uh, uh, what is the library? It's really, uh, uh, this is then Italy, <laughs> so you were talking about Greek and uh, Egypt, but it's still, um, learning from each other. It's so extremely important. Um, hey, this is the school of Athens. This is Athens, this is Greek, yeah. Uh, learning is about, you know, how technology is changing, how society is changing, how is your environment changing. We all know hey, from also what you were telling, how things are changing so extremely fast the last decades in, in, in education and, and, and your learning environment. Um, and Alma, Wilma here, <laughs> you know, and I remember had Wilma in, this was in 2013, you had the idea to update the library to the changing of the needs in, so in society and in learning. Um, and that's what we really did, you know, the cataloging was gone, we made this long um, seating element, it's not a silent library anymore. Also, I think what is really changing that at that time when we were designing it for Leo, I'm not just saying this, it's well more, you could sit in different ways, but in a way it was a little bit more similar uh, to each other, but we now really make different environments that people like to sit or sit together or to loan or to look at a concrete wall or look outside. You know, all indi individuals are different. I think that was extremely important. The, um, the, cat the periodicals were gone more computer spaces, computer places were made. Of course, this, uh, I said, the, the very popular, uh, I learned later also with mice. Uh, <laughs> uh, but also people said, uh, you can see the changing, you're allowed to bring your water, you can s s put your headset on. Also, I think a big tradition became, a change was people like to work together. So we changed those rooms in project rooms. Or also what we did, I think was very unique, that that used to be um, staff rooms, and now they're available for project rooms to be used by the, the students. And also that, <coughs> I will show you later also, that it's not such a big difference between staff and students. You can share space, even if you want sometimes. So changing what we did in 1996, what we did in 2012, and we are still updating uh, the plan. Um, even that's why it's so nice for me to stand here. We are testing, and I will show you later, that the library of the future is very much about programming. It's about lecturing. So we are now testing, where can we, ha can we do that here? Or should we do it there? And this kind of uh, happenings is a very crucial part of the library of the future. Um, I did many libraries after that. Uh, but uh, this is, for instance, the library of Birmingham, where we were very much focused but this is a combination of a research and a public library, where to put what function and how to make it very accessible uh, to other people to come in, to be very welcoming. Um, I also thought you can also learn, uh, because I think the Library of Delft was really ahead, uh, was really the library of the future at that time, 
you can learn a lot now also about public libraries. Like the, this is Tilburg. Have you been in Tilburg already? It's a nice library. And I think you can learn from it. It used to be, we are also much more dealing with existing buildings. How can you change that? Something that was a factory, not a factory, a repair hall for um, locomotives. Even locomotives could hang on the ceiling. It's a very strong construction. But also what you see that libraries are not just all alone. They try to combine it with other functions because then you get a better, more flow of people who come into your building and you can collaborate uh, much more. Of course, so co collaboration is a very much part of the library of the future. And then what you do, that you try to organize the building that way, that it's logic what's happening like here on the ground floor and what's happening higher up where it's more silent, where it's more quiet. And in the city of Tilburg, what is, uh, it's very much used by students, but they sit on the higher levels, where it's more quiet. Um, here's some images, but if you've seen it, you've seen it. <laughs> um, but also uh, talking about identity. As I told you, this library brought really, it's part of the identity of this university. This was really dealing with the identity of Tilburg. Uh, the Lockhart, we made a big table on a, uh, on the understel, I don't know English word, of the tape of the locomotives, remembering the lo locomotives, uh, playing with the curtains, uh, designed by Petra Blaise. Uh, but also in a multifunctional way, you can sit on it, but it even becomes a platform. So how to make also here an interior that you can play with it and not, you know, you have to change the whole building if you have to give a lecture was very crucial. Uh, or even with staff. Uh, how, where do you put staff? And here it's much more hybrid. Staff can walk around and sit even in the library themselves to do the work, or they have a specific own space, but it's much more flexible. And very important what we learned, and I remember when we did this library, is the coffee. Uh, you need a place to have a coffee, maybe buy, uh, buy some books, uh, but especially the coffee. And here the coffee is that a normal, they really wanted that um, also people do, who don't have that much money, that the coffee is cheap and that you can come here and a grandfather with his uh, grand, uh, granddaughter to come by and th that he or she can take a coffee or a uh, cook to, to be very much inviting and welcoming. Children, because here we don't have children, but, you know, we did it there with, together with the Efteling. You know, how can we play with children in, in their imagination? So that I want to say, that you make different um, atmospheres in, in one building. And if you ever go to the Tilburg, it's next to the train station. It's always full of people. It's really amazing. And the programming is extremely interesting. But also to have different rooms with different, uh, we call it labor laboratories what you can do there. So it's different rooms with different atmospheres. Or even this one I like always, this is to help students or people just from Tilburg to write a book. So they can sit on a table or they can do that individually. That's how we designed the table. Or you can sit together. So with the same furniture and interior, we can accommodate um, different uh, groups of people. And it's so if you have a little movie. The train table. We did the interior of this building. To have enough electricity poles, very crucial. <laughs> also, if you make a tribune. These three tables, you can, you can move them on the wheels, uh, on the rails. Children. Tables made out of old books. We glued them together. We even helped them to do it themselves, uh, to, to ourselves.
and the higher you go up, it's more student focused. Another one I wanted to show you as a library of the future, what was very specific, this is Washington. Um, on the mall, here is where Martin Luther King stood giving his speech, I have a dream. It was dealing, I don't know what, I think this is now, we did this eight years ago, and we started, was a building of Mies van der Rohe, famous architect. This was the interior, full of homeless people. This was the original design, it still looked like that, like more going into a commercial building or lobby or, but it doesn't feel like, hi, I go here with my kids to enter and to borrow a library. And it was a landmark building. The stairs were horrible, um, very asocial <laughs> and safe. Um, and it was also strange that the books were all at the edges where there was glass and in the middle were people sitting. And I had to make, uh, it was building of Luz Misfrich van der Rohe. It was named after Martin Luther King, but then the building was already finished. And of course they were both dead. And how to make that a library of the future. And this. The Gebouw van Mies van der Rohe, die the naam draagt van Martin Luther King. Uh, en de bibliotheek van de toekomst. Die drie aspecten, dat, dat ben ik nou helemaal aan het uitzoeken. Hoe dat nou moet. Martin Luther King, he is a man that represents a struggle for all colors of people. The fact that this building in this place, at the time that this building was opened, just a few years after the assassination, is a real powerful and incredible legacy and history lesson that we shouldn't lose sight of. Mooi proporties. Dan kom je in een hele kom je daar in zo'n mechano wereld die afgesloten is van mis. I never heard him say less is more. He's quoted as saying that but I never heard him say. Als hele projectarchitect. He would say we'll reduce it till it's almost nothing. Maar je kan toch zien dat er echt alles wat hij ook zegt, alles is uitgezet op de maat van de stenen. Dit is die verschrikkelijke, enge ervaring. Ja, je ziet het hier ook. Hier, dat zie je allemaal aan het hoesten is. We, we moeten die gevel vernieuwen. One architectural critic uh, some years ago called this a soul-crushing black cube. And I understand what he was talking about, really. Alle boeken die staan in het daglicht en de mensen die zitten zonder daglicht. En dat is, dat is een hele rare tegenstelling. Weet ik niet, is er, staat het nou in de allereerste originele tekening, staan dan ook al die muren er al in of niet? Mies die maakt eigenlijk altijd hele eindeloze horizontale ruimtes. Die stopt hij met een verticaal vlak, maar ik vind toch dat die muur weg moet. Daarmee wordt de bibliotheek zichtbaarder en dat maakt het gebouw veel publieker. Anything to change the, the appearance of this building. Yes, 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 I, I'm all on board. Uh, I think Mies expected and appreciated wonderful things to happen within his structure. I will show you quickly what we did. Uh, for, for, so it's very important where you make the uh, vertical uh, stairs. So that's what we changed into it uh, for a public connection. It's also by intuitive people will have to wander through a building and get inspiration. These are the ingredients or orange ones that we uh, put together into the building. So that stair became really the symbol, two of them, symmetric of course, walking up the stairs in a very um, uh, intuitive way, welcoming and wide enough that you could meet each other. Not to always take the elevator for instance, in a way what we also do here, it's really using the Opening up, this was the old entrance, opening it up new and also showcasing these stairs that say, hey, come in, uh, very crucial. Um, here's that stair. But also that whole entrance that it feels welcoming. Um, uh, it's a typical thing in the, this was the old one, we had to keep this desk here. 
I thought always uh, I'm not a fan anymore of putting desk in the front of a building because it's, you look like a, somebody controlling somebody. It's like a police agent that's not welcoming. But we had to keep it there. Uh, also having seating, they're all very empty because these pictures were made in COVID times, but also have people sitting outside. They love it. Uh, having f uh, something what I really like, what they did, they put a foil on the glass and in the evening they project their um, images and movies and also l telling the story about Washington itself, not just uh, here this uh, sitting uh, on the edge of the building, children area. Uh, we even put a slide in. So and people, it's really also stimulating that, you know, it, that it's much more a multi-generational building. Uh, also changing the light elements from the beginning, otherwise it looks like an office building. But you're thinking outside, hey, uh, the, where the circles are is, for instance, the children area. Uh, making a grand reading room. Washington, New York has one, Boston has one, but uh, Washington didn't have one. So we made here a whole, whole cut in the floor to make a grand reading room with some art. This was the roof. Now we changed it in here to make it as a public park, a pocket park in the middle of Washington with a green roof. You know, you all recognize it. With an auditorium. There we have a specific auditorium made for this kind of uh, um, events. But here we have to do it more in an um, informal way. What is also nice? A public garden in a, in a city what is so warm in the summer, so with a big canopy, beautiful gardens, sitting outside, it really becomes a destination to sit on the roof. And you recognize it. As you told you, this was the corner, but the uh, parking was so dominant, and we changed it to make it open, take the entrance to the parking garage out, because there were two, and make this corner again with a cafe, with good and cheap coffee. So if you ever go to Washington, very expensive nowadays, go and get your coffee here and just study here because it's really, and it has many, many exhibitions telling you about black history and Washington itself. Beautiful gardens again. Because nowadays biodiversity is much more important than just to make grass. Eh? That's also what I learned in all these times. So this is now uh, on 9 and G Street, that library. But bringing really so libraries is also, you know, what soul do you put into it? And I hope that the soul in this building is still that good. But for me, I really wanted the building to the values of Martin Luther King. Of course, I also had to respect Mies van der Rohe, but for me, it was really dealing with the values, the timeless values of uh, Martin Luther King. And then I will do quickly New York, and then I'm gone. Then I'm in the... I, I didn't check my time. I have the feeling that I have to run. Is that not true? Oh, yeah. Okay, then New York. Yeah? Oh, then I, had, I thought I have to do it very quickly. Okay. This is then about um, New York. So after Washington, two years later, we also started to work on New York. And I thought it's interesting because if, you I, if I think about the library of the future, of course, New York Public Library is really one of the iconic um, univers um, library systems in the world. And it has research libraries, and it has public libraries, and what we call the, the circulating libraries. Uh, here you can see, I don't know, you can see that there, with the green roof, and here the, the building. It's really in the middle of Manhattan, um, next to Bryant Park. Um, and what was our commission? To make um, a coherent plan, because there were two libraries next to each other. The research library had a famous one next to in, in Bryant Park with the two lions. And just across the street was the circulating library, the Mid-Manhattan Library. In a way, the research library was much more used for tourists and researchers. But all people of New York were studying in the Mid-Manhattan Library. Um, and what we did as to begin, that's why we called it also a master plan, to go really in depth in the programming. And that's also, I think, what we always try to do with the different uh, directors of this library. You know, what needs, what changes, uh, what kind of programs, what functions are logical to put where. And that's what we really did for these two buildings. For instance, there used to be in the research library, the children library. And we said, no, children should go to the, to the 
the circulating library. Or the, some of the collection of the circulating library should go into the research library. So we, we, we really were totally involved in the programming. This building was designed, it was opened in, I think, in 1914 or 1970, I don't know anymore. But it was, you know, also a zeitgeist, you know. But in a way, this library was designed if there was a very rich person, white, male, and every room was with all shelving around him with books. That doesn't work anymore for many reasons, because this is really an archival library where you cannot show, like here, the books, because they are... Uh, they are um, part of the archive system. You, have, you can't put them uh, in the open air anymore. But also at that time, it was really uh, designed like that. You can see that, that as a symbol of knowledge was books. And the grand rose main reading room was put on what they call the stacks where all the books were. And there you could connect to get, if you needed a book, huh? like here with the elevator, you get the book up and then you can uh, study that book. This was the building across. So this was that area in that time, the Beaux-Arts uh, period in architecture. Uh, horses were just kind of gone, very busy with cars, noisy, dirty. And this what used to be an, um, an, a department store. And they changed in the 80s to um, a library, that building. Um, so this is what I told you. We were really kind of trying to think, and that's what we often do when we design libraries, you know, where to put what function, what kind of atmosphere, what kind of people you want to address, in the knowledge that everybody is different. Um, so we listened, also to listen to the logic of a building, that's also a search, eh? because we also keep updating this one, but there is a kind of logic in a certain building, that's in this building, that's in that building, but also the building across. Um, so that's why we uh, in this one, we were really trying to make it more logical where you keep the visitors, uh, the tourists, where you put the researchers, and where you have the events. Because in the United States, events are a very important part of the financial uh, possibilities of the library. Um, so we did design this desk, for instance, but also we were designing in a kind of modest way that I think if you go there now, we spent 500,000 million, uh, five, uh, and a half miliard. That is 500, no, 500 million, yeah, I'm a little bit confused. But if you, now it's almost done, you think, oh, it was always like that, but it's not. But we did so much going, making also an exhibition. Exhibitions are also important of uh, libraries that you want to communicate something. Huh? Like, as I told you, in Washington, it's really telling the story of the city of Washington and black history, and also what's happening nowadays. Um, important how to change it. And uh, I don't cannot show you yet the new uh, images, but what we also did, and that's interesting for a research library, how to attract also a young generation that they want to do research in the future. And that was for them, and so we made a new entrance. We will make a, a kind of education center, but that's more addressing uh, young adults and to stimulate them to use the collection. Because also in this building, you have a collection, but why you keep it? You want it that it, it's, you don't just want to, then you can also put it somewhere else. Uh, but you want people to stimulate it, show it it's there, but you also want to let them use it. So that is a very important task, what we are doing in, in this library. Um, so that's why we made this new entrance for researchers, for staff, but also to stimulate uh, this sketch we made, I think, eight years ago, that we wanted to connect these two buildings, that also to stimulate people coming from, a, um, not from a research library, from a background of a public library, to make it for them also interesting to go to this one. Um, I will show you now the Mid-Manhattan Library, the circulating library. But I think it's more mixing up what are university libraries, research libraries, and public libraries, uh, circulating libraries. This is how it looked like. Also in the UK and the USA, public buildings, they smell. They don't... Uh, 
It's, these words are not from me, eh? these are from a journalist, but it's true. Along that, if you really want kind of tables there, I don't... It's about ventilation, it's about... Uh, but at the same time, full of people. Eh? It was uh, not a very pleasant atmosphere. But the feeling that it's for all, that it's for everybody accessible, is extremely important uh, for a public building, certainly also in uh, New York. And here we walk on the roof. This is also typical United States, like what you saw, what we did in Washington. Uh, why, why not use this roof? This is the most beautiful spot to look around. And if also, if you look back to when we did this building, we, we, you don't see mechanical equipment on the roof. We were very much fighting to solve it that you don't see mechanical equipment. It's a building, Fifth Avenue, 40th Street, if you go there, uh, with a, framed, a, framed, a strange floor plan, because it used to be a um, department store. They also had the delivery entrance, so they, it's what we call the long arm. And also typically uh, New York is that the building next to us, the adjacent building, was allowed to build higher and that if you create a pocket park. So we had a small pocket park. But people even in, in the working there already for 30 years in the library, they never had realized that they had no windows to that pocket park. Uh, it was a building with an enormous amount of columns. We had to keep the building, had the bones. So I said, what to do with all these columns? And I always try to do make something positive, negative, positive. But there was also an essential, almost political issue that they wanted to keep the, they had to promise that they had to keep the same amount of books in the building. But we said, okay, if we put all these books there, then there's no place to sit. So it's what we did. We made this, what I call the long arm. We changed it in the long room. And we put most of our books in high shelving over there. So we could create on the other floors, more lower shelving, that depending on what kind of collection, with a lot of seating. And it was really much inspired by this library, huh? how we made there an, uh, an, an uh, element, like a, a book of walls, or wha what we did in Birmingham, where we created the book rotunda, or the long room of Trinity College. So I also called it the long room. So that's again what it is, you know? It was a building that was really, yeah, nothing. Um, with, a, uh, with a basement, with no daylight, people working there, the book handling was there, and we changed it like that. And that's what I want to say, what is the library of the future, is really thinking of, of programming, about people, about their needs. And here we put the children and the teens area in the lower ground floor, gave them their own entrance, with uh, voids, with daylight. On, on Fifth Avenue is um, more grab and go, quick things like this floor. You go higher up the three floors and we made this long room, we made it five floors, so you can see three and five floors with a book collection and next to it, uh, yeah, the reading uh, uh, yeah, the kind of spaces to read a book, to study. It's what is, what is a normal um, circulating library. And then we made two floors, and I think that what's interesting also for here is what I learned in Birmingham, but also in New York, is that you want people to develop themselves. Here they come in, for instance, they don't know English very well, English as your second language courses, or to help them to use a computer. But you also want to empower them to start their own business. Or, so that's connected to itself, that the learning center, one floor, is connected to a business floor, where people from New York help other people to set up, a, set up a business or get a job or write a CV. What could be also maybe interesting for a university library? And on top of it, what I call the wizard hat is for events like this. Uh, but they also make money because now it's a very popular space to marry in uh, New York. So here you see the wizard hat. I'm standing in front of the, uh, the research library, the central library. The columns, as I told you, we start to celebrate them. 
if you yes, we, you have to start to like them. So this became our entrance. And what I what we really said here: don't put the desk in front of a, where people enter. People can find a way themselves. And the most asked question always at a desk asked people is, where are the toilets? So we make clear where are the toilets, where are the stairs. But also, if you can't solve it themselves, then you go to a desk. And of course, you have to see the desk. Um, here you see that. Uh, also celebrate this entrance with, uh, with light. Have a table where you uh, show what kind of books are interesting in what's happening in the world at this time. And change that, almost like in a bookstore. Uh, have programming space in front of it. So people passing by on Fifth Avenue can think, hey, I can participate, very important. Even the model of Meccano is still there if you go on Fifth Avenue. Uh, going down to a teenage area, because here the kids come, eh, the teenagers, after three o'clock. They hang around here, they have their own space. Uh, they're next to the children, but we don't tell them that they're next to the children because they don't want to be mixed up with children. Um, there's really create space to make your own podcast, to make uh, work with audio uh, techniques. So more media center is, is part of this. I, I think that that's also some ideas that will maybe happen here in this library. Um, thinking again of kids, very important cultural differences between children library. Uh, you're not allowed as an, if you're not a parent of a caretaker to see the children. So we always have to protect them different culture than in the Netherlands. Also showcase how you handle books. So we made a big window and children love it because they really you know, want to, and then they see what's happening there. But it's also nice for the staff because in the United States, a lot of people work without daylight and they can see who they're working for. The void we made, it was not easy, I have to tell you. Uh, had to make, cut three floors out and to make five to make a lot of books visible, but also of storage space. And that became the long room. It's with a beautiful ceiling uh, by an uh, artist we selected, giving it a color, the red. Here it's the blue, here that's the red, antique red. Uh, and also, it, it's this, this we call it also the stack. We would never have saw, designed this building by not working at the same time on the other building. You know, the stacks are a kind of knippo, a wink, to the stacks that are in that building, who are totally unusable and not flexible anymore. It's still empty, I have to tell you. Or, as you see here, you see these stacks, and they are accessible even in a wheelchair. Um, you can find your own book. That's important. Also designing our own chairs, what are uh, inspired, of course, by the Rose Main Reading Room and um, but also have long tables, own chairs, but also we have every year uh, here a gala in, uh, in New York, and then we sit on all these tables and have a beautiful dinner there. And that's what I want to tell you. It's also interesting, especially this floor, how you can program it, that you have things that are recognizable, but that you can use in different ways. I think it's for me extremely important. Looking back to the, the, three, the two libraries that you can see each other, and also, again, as I just told you, this, uh, the, floor, the fifth and the sixth floor are this learning center and the business library that you combine it to stimulate people to um, develop themselves. Because it's very much about learning, but it's about developing people and empowering people. And then the top, as you can see, what we did, we put the wizard hat, I call it, on top of it. We did elevate it because we want people to oversee the historical parapet. Otherwise, you could not, see, um, could not see back to Fifth Avenue and to the other library. So we did, you can see, we did elevate it. And we made a beautiful ter terrace there. And you can also see that the wizard hat is inspired by the Beaux-Arts buildings around us. It always had a kind of special hat on top of the building. This is now one of the favorite spots in New York uh, to sit there and that, that it's free. You can bring your own coffee or you can buy a coffee uh, in mid Manhattan. Here, looking back to the, the other library, connecting the two of them. Um, 
the wizard hat what is very much used as i told you for programming um, thinking again about the library of the future in my experience is very much about programming sharing knowledge sitting together having some food um, and of course also all these quiet spaces different kind of spaces i don't know if you've been already in the cone which also changed the updated the, the interior had to make if this is more busy floor then that floor should be much more quiet. Uh, we did improve the acoustics. It still needs some to change of the ceilings. Um, um, but I, we are really defining where is the quiet space, where is the collaboration space, and where is the programming space in this building. Uh, this, this is the, what's happening in the wizard head. And it's a very flexible space. OK. So now you all have to go not only to Delft and Tilburg, <laughs> uh, maybe Birmingham, but also Washington and New York. Um, and it, this library, what was, I, f I think, our first big one, has been very inspirational and always be, have been staying in contact with the different uh, directors and also, you know, that we want to learn and we're not static or... Um, um, that the library of the future is also a changing library. Um, that was my story. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for. Yes? Yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you very yeah. much, uh, Francine. Yeah. And also, Irene, for your beautiful stories and vision about libraries. When I started working here, I think six and a half years ago. I was thinking, why is the building so important for the people who work here? I really, I know that the buildings are important, but now you tell us more about the interaction. You use words that triggers me. You said uh, share stories. We have to share stories because we have a lot of data, information, but uh, people uh, sometimes don't know that we have that information here in the building. Yes, we have it in, in objects or physical, or we have it uh, digital, but they don't know. So we have to share stories to share information and knowledge. And you said connection and collection, and I think the, uh, the, the programming that we are doing is all about connection, and uh, we like to share the knowledge, and that's our building for. And I want to thank you, especially because we know that you are traveling all over the world to make these kind of wonderful buildings. And it was so nice to have you here today on our special birthday. Okay. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. And take care of the baby. <laughs>